Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for this Sunday morning service. Tusculum Hills Baptist Church is a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word. For those who are joining us by television, I want to tell you that uh, the equipment that you see around us is uh, part of a revival that's happening here at our church. Uh, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night, and I told the revival team just to leave up their equipment. There was no sense in them taking it down. But I asked the people watching by television, when you see this, uh, the revival will be over for a week. But I ask you to pray for all the people whose lives were changed during this time. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. This morning I want to preach to you about Paul's disappointment, the Apostle Paul's disappointment. Galatians chapter 1, starting with verse 1. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers with me, to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote many letters and he wrote this letter to the churches in Galatia. He had a vested interest in these churches because he helped start them and he helped nurture them. And in his other letters, Paul starts off with a compliment. He starts off on a positive note by complimenting the people. He usually sets aside a sentence for this. But there are things different in the opening of the book of Galatians. It's obviously that something is seriously wrong. In the book of Romans, Paul addressed the believers. He said this, To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be His holy people. In 1 Corinthians, he says, To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be His holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. And then in 2 Corinthians, he says, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Achaia. And then in Ephesians, when he addressed the church of Ephesus, he said to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. And then in Philippians, his letter to the people there, Paul said to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi together with the overseers and deacons. And then in his other letter, next letter in Colossians, he said to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. And then when he wrote Timothy, he said, I always thank God for you and continually mention you in our prayers. Then in his second letter to Timothy, he said, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus to Timothy. And then to Titus, he said, My true son in our common faith. And then in his last letter that's in the Bible in Philemon, he says, To Philemon, our dear brother and fellow worker, now, something was wrong at the churches in Galatia because Paul addressed them differently. In his greeting, he did not call them holy. He did not call them friend. He did not call them chosen or anything close to that kind of language that he used in his other letters. He got right to the point. Something was terribly wrong. He started by claiming the source of the authority of his words. And then he got right down to business. Since Paul addressed several churches, it's apparent that an infection had spread. You see, this was to the churches in Galatia, not just one church. Church infections need to be stamped out quickly. They can spread quickly, just like a disease, just like the flu. And many people can become spiritually sick. Now, today, and I'm not going to spend much time on this, but I see church infections today spreading. And I see three different types of infections that spread in churches. 
The first one is the one that was happening, we think, right here in the church in Galatia, is unchallenged heresy. I believe that this was going on in these churches, and it goes on today. Somebody that teaches half-truths. See, a half-truth is heresy. Only the full truth is the gospel. Heresy goes unchallenged because people are unlearned. Most people know just enough Bible to be dangerous. And they are blown to and fro with the latest whim of false doctrine. Then I also see unchallenged complaining. And we see this in some of the epistles that Paul wrote to the churches. Just unchallenged complaining. Ch complaining goes unchallenged. I'm not sure why. I really am not sure why. I don't have an answer for you there. Uh, the best thing is to determine whether somebody's complaint is legitimate or illegitimate. Sometimes complaints are legitimate. If they're legitimate, we need to deal with it. If somebody's complaint is illegitimate, just tell them to shut up. <laughs> that's, that's just the most spiritual answer I can give you on that. Because that's what the Apostle Paul would have done. And then... A church infection that I see spreading today also is what I call selfish church competition. One church sees what another church is doing, or they see God moving in another church, and they want to be the copycat of the other church. Instead of praying and asking God, what is it that you would have us to do in our church? Instead of doing that, churches start spending all their resources to copy what a church down the road is doing. Well, Paul does say in his letter to Galatia, grace and peace. Two words that he uses over and over in all of his epistles. So he did include that when he introduced this letter. Read with me verses 4 and 5 talks about our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So his introduction becomes somewhat of a prayer. And he sets the stage for a rebuke by establishing the lordship of Jesus Christ. And Paul dealt with this same type of situation that we're going to talk about here in Galatians when he confronted the false teaching of the Judaizers. These were people who were trying to entice Christians to come back to the Jewish religious system that Jesus had come to fulfill and provide a new way. So Galatians is a dangerous book. If you make notes in your Bible, you might put right above the word Galatians, this is a dangerous book, exclamation point. The reason it's dangerous is because for those who prefer to try to earn their salvation by works, Galatians is very confrontive. And this is the book that works-based theology, churches and teaching, try to avoid. So before Paul rebuked them, he reminded them what it's all about. He explains what Christ did. He died for us. He explained why Christ died for us. To deliver us. See, people who have come to faith in Christ have been delivered from sin and all kinds of things. And see, it's, in, 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 Galatia, in Galatia, people were trying to get the Christians to leave their freedom and leave their de deliverance and move back to the bondage of the law. And then Paul also explained ex why God willed it to be so. Well, next we have that Paul reiterated that there is only one gospel. There are not multiple gospels. There's only one. And we know that gospel means good news. So there's only one good news. And that's that Jesus came to save sinners. Read with me, starting in verse 6. Paul said, I'm astonished that you who are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. 
But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. And as we have already said, so now I say again, he just repeats himself, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than the one you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I, am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. It does seem that we must remind ourselves that there is only one gospel. Don't hesitate to remind me of that. I'll not hesitate to remind you of that. It seems that not much has changed since Paul wrote this letter. Why is it that we must be reminded of this? I think it's because all of us are prone to think of ourselves better than we are. And that our goodness and that our works have some type of salvation value. Now, it's hard for us to accept the fact sometimes that Jesus really did pay it all. But he did. Jesus paid it all without any help or assistance from you or me. And he does not need any help forgiving sins from you or for me. It's his business. He did it. And it's up to us to accept that. You know, I've learned from witnessing the people through the years that the first thing people, many people say is, well, I really am a good person. Now see, wh why, would, why would someone say that unless they think that their goodness has some type of salvation value. And when somebody tells me, well, I really am a good person, I always respond, well, I'm, I'm sure you are. But that's not the issue. See, goodness is not the ticket to peace with God. Salvation by faith, through gra by grace through faith, is faith in Jesus. Now, God spoke to Martin Luther through the book of Galatians. It was one of his favorite books. And his love for the truth of, of the book of this Bible helped spark the Reformation that changed the world forever. Now, after experiencing God's grace and forgiveness, Luther was able to speak some simple words that sums up the gospel. He studied and studied and studied, and he came up with three phrases. And these words would have him hunted persecuted and jailed. You've heard it before. Scripture only, faith only, grace only. And he believed that anything more or anything less was a grave error. And so it's easy for us to, as people, to make the one gospel difficult, isn't it? Because it's such a miracle. Well, I took uh, youth to a conference a few years ago. And the next year, I passed on that conference and took youth to another conference. But at this conference, there was a, it started off good and it was exciting. There were a lot of young people there and the speaker got up to speak and then he started in on music. That was his topic. And at first, there was nothing wrong with what he said. And he pointed out the vulgarity in a lot of music that young people listen to. I agreed with him on this, and you would have agreed with him. But as he progressed in his message, he got to a point where he pushed the young people to make a decision that from that day forward they would only listen to Christian music. And I thought, oh, no, here we go, here we go. So all these kids, Jerry, I'm sure you've seen this probably in your ministry. All these kids came forward. They're making this commitment to only listen to Christian music for the rest of their lives. The pressure was high. Probably a thousand youth responded. Now, now, that might sound good to you, but let me tell you how this played out. Some of those same teens were in my car one day. And I had the radio on, some local station. 
I don't remember what it was. It was on when they got in the car. And one girl said, Brother Paul, you have to change the channel because I made a commitment never, never to listen to anything but Christian music. And my reply was, it's my car, and I didn't make that commitment. <laughs> now, I didn't mean to, to be ugly to her, but as her youth pastor, I wanted to make a point. Uh, you know, I felt, I wanted her to, to know, that I felt as if she felt she was letting God down because she made a commitment that she couldn't keep. And I said to her, you know, what are you going to do for the rest of your life when you're in an elevator? What are you going to do for the rest of your life when you're at the mall? Are, are, you, are you not going to teach your kids, row, row, row your boat? Or B-I-N-G-O? Or twinkle, twinkle, little star? Because you've made a commitment that's unrealistic. The original spirit behind the speaker was to avoid vulgar music. But he kept going on and on and on and on because... As a conference leader, he probably needed to be able to say that X number of decisions were made at his crusade. You see, we can take a simple message and push it to a point that it's unrealistic. And sometimes people take the gospel and they, they pervert it. And they turn it into something that it was not meant to be. And they make people miserable by saying... God said this. And God wants me to tell you this. God told me to tell you. You ever heard that? God gave me two ears. If somebody tells me that God told them to tell me something, I'll listen, but God can tell me. Now, I can hear the Judaizers now. Those who just could not accept the simplicity in Christ. Just as when I've shared with people, they'll say, that, that's it? It's so simple. But really, when you think about it, you, you, you think, that's it? Wow. Jesus did that for me? I can just hear the Judaizers saying, hey, we've got the rule book. The rule book worked for thousands of years. It's tried and true. We know it. Left and right, up and down and all around, we know it. We've lived it. Come on back. Come on back. Surely you don't believe that faith alone in Jesus saves you. How can that be? Now there's only one gospel. And there are people around every corner that want to take away the joy of your salvation. They want to do it. They want to just suck the life out of you and take the joy of your salvation away by telling you there's more to the truth than you know. Don't let anybody rob you of your joy in Christ. If somebody robs you of your joy in Christ, you've let them do it. Don't let them do it. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3 says, And I fear, lest as the serpent did beguile Eve in his subtlety, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, the subtlety. How did the serpent trick Eve? He tricked Eve by, by, by telling Eve something that sounded believable, something that sounded enticing. If you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then you'll be like God. And you see, for something to be acceptable, it must be believable, it must be enticing. And it must make sense at the moment. Now, if you're afraid that you don't know your Bible enough to avoid being tricked, here's my advice for you, because I know we've got some new believers here. Study your Bible more. Listen to good teaching and all the while be sensitive to God's Spirit inside you. Because the Holy Spirit in you will blow the whistle. Now, the people in Galatia had taken a simple gospel and they compl complicated it. Now, there are only three times that the verb pervert is used in the New Testament. In verse 7 is one of those times. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. 
And the definition of pervert is to turn around, to change into an opposite direction or character or to reverse something. And so the Judaizers had actually reversed the gospel, turning it around and taking people back to the Old Testament laws and abandoning the fulfillment of the law in Jesus Christ. Now, there are people who pervert the gospel everywhere. Every now and then, a popular charlatan hits the airwaves. I'm not aware of one right now, but be ready. It will happen. And this charlatan pre presents himself as a preacher. And this, this phony will promote this absurd idea of, of seed faith that attempts to manipulate people into thinking that you must give to this person's TV ministry. Or money tree. Money tree. I guess ministry money tree is what it is. Now, their lies go something like this. They teach laws of success and try to make it sound spiritual. They spread false concepts of faith, false concepts of God. They utter false prophecies and they built people out of money and they give false hope to people of financial gain through these so-called vows. Really, you know, I just can't believe anybody is deceived by that. But they are. They are. A friend of mine told me in the Bahamas, on one of the poorer islands, they call the family islands, they used to call them the out islands, now they're called the family islands, that now that they have satellite TV, they watch this. And people who are already impoverished send in their last bit of money to some phony American preacher believing that their ship's going to come in. How awful. Now, the people in Galatia weren't much different. They, be they began their lives in the Spirit, but now they were going to try to continue in the flesh. And then the last thing we see here is that Paul made no apologies for defending the truth. The gospel must be defended. And if somebody says something that doesn't sound like the truth to you and you don't know the exact answer, the best thing to say is, that doesn't really sound right to me. If you don't know the book, chapter, and verse to refute it, you say, that, something, that just doesn't sound right. Christians cannot sit idly by and allow the heresy of any sort to pervert the gospel. And in this passage, Paul uses some of the strongest words in Scripture ever used because he wants to set the record straight and he's upset that people are being led astray. Now do you remember when 9-11 happened and how everybody wanted to do something to defend freedom? Flag sales skyrocketed. America came together. And in, in my lifetime, that's the most unified America has ever been. You see, Paul was just as passionate in defending the gospel. Some things are really worth defending. Now think about it. Paul said, even if he or anyone else, including an angel, and we know that angels are messengers from God, if, if any of these said something other than what they had already said to be the truth, then that they were eternally condemned to not listen to them. And in verse 10, Paul says that he is not a man pleaser. Why? Because his message wasn't from a man. The Judaizers, and today we can call them legalists, are so bent on pleasing people and making their works known that they forget about God. So I ask you this morning, are you attempting to earn your salvation? Once I preached a message on grace, and afterwards a woman said to me, it's what you do for him that will get you there, and don't you forget it. She said that to me. And, you know, my thoughts are, really? Can you show that to me in the Bible? If that's true, then I've got a whole lot of work to do, and you do too. And we'll never know when we worked enough. We'll just work ourselves to death. But listen to this. Here's the truth of what that woman said. The extended version that's truth. It's not what you do 
for Him that gets you there. It's what He's done for you that gets you there. Following your list of works that you think will get you to heaven will only get you to hell faster. Now, people become Christians by trusting in Christ, not by following rules. You cannot work, mix works and grace for salvation. We believe as Christians, our works follow the commitment that's already been made inside. But it's not a means to, it's a result of. These two are diametrically opposed. Listen, a grace-based salvation does not require works. A works-based salvation does not require Jesus. If we could work our way to heaven, then there would have been no need for Jesus to die on the cross. Ultimately, Paul understood between what the church needed to hear and what they wanted to hear. Now, if you've spent your life trying to earn God's favor, today is your day of surrender. You've got to let it go or you will continue in a life of misery trying to equate your works with what Jesus did on the cross. That sounds, that is just even a blasphemous statement, isn't it? The man who wrote Galatians originally thought he was pleasing God by persecuting Christians and then one day God, God got a hold of him. Let's read in verse 22. Paul says, I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report that the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. So Jesus is in the life-changing business. Won't you come to him today? Don't put it off anymore. The last two nights we had people who grew up in a very different system of belief than what we know to be the truth. And these people who put their faith in Christ have risked and suffered ridicule and banishment from some of their own families. But they stood up because they heard the truth. And they said, I want the truth. Jesus died for me, and I want Jesus. Can you stand up for Jesus today? Can you repent of your sins? Can you accept the fact that your works to get God's attention is nothing more than filthy rags? And can you reach up empty-handed and say, Jesus, I give all of myself that I know to be of me to all of you that I know to be of you. That's what it's about. And what a relief when we let go of trying to earn it. What a relief. Jesus has come to save sinners. He's come to set captives free. You may be one who has accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. You've, he is your Savior and you, you know that there was a time and a place and a condition of your heart where you accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. But over the years, you've become like the people in the churches in Galatia. And you've added on things that's more than just the message of salvation. Again, let me be clear. Our works, Ephesians 2.10, God created before the foundation of the earth for us to do good works as a result of salvation, but not as a means to salvation. Let's bow our heads for prayer.